Thank you. Um, I'm depressed. I've just listened to Felix, and he's 16, and Millie is 12. I feel like I've done nothing <laughs> to talk to you about. But um, it's fantastic to be here, seriously. I'm all that stands between you and your lunch now, uh, so I'm conscious of that. Um, so I don't want to take very long. I just wanted to reflect on a few things that happened uh, during the morning. And uh, it is true, by the way, that I am from Liverpool. I was brought up in uh, Walton. Uh, but I live now in California. So there. <laughs> <laughs> and you don't. And <laughs> but I'm back. And actually, we're thinking of moving back. Liverpool's fantastic just now, isn't it? Uh, the, uh, I mean, the... Um, you know, the growth of talent here, all the new facilities that have come in. You know, we're staying in Liverpool One just now. Um, and also, watching this event take place that's, that's rooted in Liverpool, there's a huge amount to be proud of here. Um, so, uh, for me, it's not just a nostalgic trip back. I'm, I'm just thrilled to be back. So, uh, firstly, hasn't it been a fantastic morning? All in. And I think... Could we just congratulate Chris Arnold and, and the whole team who's put this thing together? Um, that was it. Thank you very much. That's right. I'm going now. I've had enough. Um, so let me just tell you quickly what I do. Uh, I work, and I'll only be about 10, 15 minutes, I promise you. I work in education. I always did. I went to school in Liverpool. Uh, I used to go to the old collegiate uh, here before that was closed. Um, I went to the Margaret Bevan School before that was closed. All the schools I go to get closed. That's the interesting thing about it. But one of my big themes in my life has been that everybody has profound talents. But most people don't really ever properly discover them. They never really find out what they're good at. And one of the consequences is that an awful lot of people go through their lives thinking they're not really good at anything that they don't have any special contribution to make. You know, they kind of get through the week and they wait for the weekend. But I also meet people who absolutely love what they do, who feel they have discovered what they should be doing with their lives and what their authentic life really is. And one of the reasons, in my experience, that many people don't discover the things they're good at, ironically, is education. And I don't say this in criticism of teachers, who I think are... You know, it's one of the most honorable professions you can go in. M my life has been shaped by great teachers. I'm not blaming particular schools or head teachers, but there's something in the culture of a lot of the way schools work that doesn't help people discover their real talents. It's about whether you can do this or not. Um, you know, it'd be like if you thought of the whole of sport, you know, all the various ways you can be a great athlete, and said, yes, you're really, the really great athletes are the ones who play basketball. You know, they're the ones we're looking for, the ones who can be good at that. And uh, if you can't do basketball, we have remedial programs for people who like to play football, you know, or tennis. You know, they're not as good, you know, but it's a way of keeping them occupied. And we tend to do that with schools. We have a very narrow view of ability and talent and intelligence that runs through our school system. So I work a lot on that. And some of the most brilliant people I know uh, didn't do particularly well at school and didn't really enjoy it. I mean, there are brilliant schools, of course. I'm not saying there aren't. But a lot of people didn't really enjoy it. The second theme for me is that, is that uh, we are living in times of revolution. I mean, this is what Felix is talking about. Uh, I'm going to have to talk to Felix, because um, I wonder when we're going to have enough trees. You know what I mean? We've got 13 billion and counting. It's going to be hard to walk down the street eventually, isn't it? We'll be like, Felix, enough trees now. You know. <laughs> we're trying to play football. There is nowhere to score the goal from. You know, Everton's going to have to adopt their entire playing style, aren't they, in Liverpool? You know, slaloming around the thing. But he's completely right, completely right. It's a fantastic campaign, and it, it's a brilliant achievement. I mean, I'm absolutely awestruck by what he's done. I mean, from the age of, what, eight, moving forward from there. Uh, I saw a program on the television a while ago. That's not surprising, is it? There are programs on all the time. I happen to see one of them. But this was uh, presented by David Attenborough. It was about how many people can live on Earth. It was called, How Many People Can Live on Earth? <laughs> They're very good at titles at the BBC, I find. But they came out with a statistic which was supported by what Felix was saying. 
which it, they looked at the available supplies of food and water and fuel on the Earth and said, you know, how many people can the Earth support on the way we currently do things? By the way, can I ask you, how many people do you think have ever lived on Earth? Let me, I'll give you a clue here. I'm not talking about prehistoric creatures who went around on their knuckles, you know, grunting. I'm talking about groovy people, you know, like us, you know, with attractive profiles and, and a sense of irony. You know, we, we are thought to have evolved on the planet maybe um, 150,000 years ago. I mean, we were cooking for a long time before that. We've been around for millions of years. I mean, the species has been evolving. Um, but modern human beings like us, you know, with articulate language and, you know, dress sense, and uh, people go to conferences. We've been around for about 150,000 years. How many do you think, how many people do you think have be, ever lived on the earth? What number would come to your mind? 30 people. <laughs> There's 400 in here, where have you been? <laughs> Wait outside, I'll speak to reference. <laughs> no, what's say 31. 30 billion, thank you. Any more? 18 billion? 50, do I hear 60? <laughs> All right, let me tell you, as time is short. Nobody knows, okay? <laughs> no, not, 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 not definitely, because we've not been counting all this time, have we? We haven't been going around with calculators saying there's four more over here. <laughs> but, uh, so it's a guess. But if you, go on the, if you Google the question, which is what I did, you will come up with an You'll see that statisticians have gathered around the idea that there are probably, be, maybe over the past 150,000 years, between 80 and 120 billion. Now, you, know, you heard earlier what a billion is. You know, it's a massive number, but it's... Um, so let's say 100 billion. 100 billion people maybe have... People like you, you know, who've walked the earth, woke up in the morning, worried about things, excited to do certain things, you know, uh, with friends and relatives and challenges, down through the ages. Maybe 100 billion people like us have lived. But here's the thing. Of all the people who've ever lived on the Earth, almost 10% are on the planet now. We are the biggest generation in the history of humanity by a mile. Um, in the 19th century, there were about fewer than 100 billion people. For most of human history, there was hardly anybody around. And about 300 years ago, the population started to shoot up. I have a little graphic here, if it'll work. I'll show you. Um, what do you think? <laughs> okay, okay. That's the world population from 10,000 BC to now. Can you see what happened? It just shot straight up in the last 300 years. Absolutely exponential. But here's the really interesting thing. This is what, if you could give this a close up of the sharp end of that graph. That's the population in the old, you know, the developed countries like us, you know, America and the UK. That's the rest of the world. The population is not only getting bigger, it's shifting ground. Uh, more and more people are coming up in other countries. I mean, the population in the old part of the world is getting older. You know, it's all the baby boomers kind of fading off. Uh, but in some parts of the world, the population is getting younger and younger. It's why your generation is so vital. Um, and more and more people are living in cities, not all, not all groovy cities like Liverpool. Uh, this is Caracas, or part of Caracas in Venezuela. The architect is not known here, by the way. Uh, but, but we're trying to get something similar off the ground in Dingle at the minute. It's, it's, uh, <laughs> this is just people building vernacular housing wherever they are and just moving in. Over half the world now lives in cities, about 60%. But here's the thing. Um, by the middle of the century, there'll be 9 billion people on the planet as things go, and maybe 10 billion by the end of it. So there was this program, how many people can live on Earth, and uh, uh, David Attenborough looked at all these different things, uh, f few food and fuel and water, and he concluded that if everybody on the Earth consumed, that's what Felix was saying, at the same rate as the average person in India, the Earth could sustain a maximum population of 1.5 billion people. But we're at 7.5 billion now. So they said if everybody on the Earth wanted to consume at the same rate as the average person in North America, the Earth could sustain a maximum population... Oh, sorry, let me go back. If 
everybody can ship the same rate as the average person in India, forgive me, the Earth could sustain a maximum population of 15 billion. I've just got this back to front, about 15 billion. The thing is, we don't all consume as they do in India, do we? Uh, they said if everybody on the Earth consumed at the same rate as the average person in Europe or North America, the Earth could sustain a maximum population of 1.5 billion. So we're at 7.5 billion now. So if the whole world wants to live like we do, eat the food we eat, hang out the way we do, consume fuel on cars and things, by the middle of the century, we'll need about four more planets to make that work. Well, we don't have them. So there is a massive challenge that we're all facing. And the irony is this, that it's being caused by the creativity of people, by this powerful uh, set of capabilities we have that we think of as the imagination and creativity. It, it's people who are changing the face of the earth. You know, it's not the lemurs and the dogs and the cats, especially. Uh, human beings are born with a tremendous sense of imagination and creativity, but we haven't quite seen far enough. And that's a lot of my argument, that we need to think differently about the challenges we face and the talents we have. And this is why World Merit Day is so important, because it's an appeal for people to dig deeper into their own talents. I wrote a book a couple of years ago called The Element, How Finding Your Passion Changes Everything. This book, by the way, is terrific. <laughs> You'd be foolish not to buy this book really, and, and, and several copies of it, really, if you've got friends. And it's about finding that place in your life where you feel that you're most authentic. To be in your element is two things. When I, when I said I meet lots of people who don't know what they're doing with their lives, but I know people who do, I meet people who just love what they do and live for it. Uh, and clearly Felix does, and Millie does, and uh, lots of people you've seen on the stage this morning, those dancers we saw earlier, they've found some talent in themselves which m makes them uh, feel that they are being their true self. It's two things, you know, I think, to be in your element. One of them is you're doing something that you're naturally good at, uh, that you've discovered something that you feel like, you know, I get this. I'm sure there are things like that in your life, aren't there? I know some people who, you know, they walk into a, a basketball court and I think, they think, I get this. Other people walk into a, a physics lab and think, oh, yeah, I know what all this is about. Other people struggle with the same thing. It's about natural aptitude. I mean, there are some things I'm good at and some things, frankly, not. You know, I was, um, I mean, my brother Ian's here. Ian's a natural musician. Uh, my brother Neil is here, who's a natural uh, soccer player. Um, my brother John here is like me, he's got much more of an academic bent. But there, there are seven of us in the family, but we're all different. Uh, we're just drawn to different sorts of things. But it's not enough to be good at something. To be in your element, you have to love it. It's what Jack Healy was saying earlier. If you can find that passion, if you can discover things you're good at, your whole life goes in a different direction. And this is the thing, you end up creating your life. Don't let anybody tell you anything different. Your life is not planned out. It's not something that you can completely plan for, you can anticipate it, but you're not a train on rails. You can change direction, you can do different things if you discover these passions inside of yourself. One of the people I interviewed for the book um, uh, is a guy called Bart Connor. Has anybody here heard of Bart Connor? Well, I'll tell you, Bart Connor, uh, when he was eight, he discovered that he could, he discovered something odd. He discovered he could walk on his hands as easily as he could walk on his feet. We don't know how he discovered this, but he did. He said it wasn't much use, you know, but he was in constant demand at parties. <laughs> and, and then he discovered he could walk up and down stairs on his hands. Again, you know, not something he saw a great future in. Um, but his father said, you know, whenever the, there was a meeting at the house and the conversation lulled, he'd say, Bart, do the hands thing there, would you? you know, and, and the party would get back on its feet. Although Bart hadn't. And anyway, when he was 10, his mother, who'd been thinking about this, uh, asked the school if they could go to the local gymnastics center, where he lived in M Morton Grove, Illinois. And he said, I'll never forget the moment when I walked into the gymnasium. I said, what was it? He said, it was intoxicating. I said, why? He said, because, you know, there were wall bars, ropes, trampolines. Um, it was like Disneyland and um, Santa's Grotto all in one place. He said it was intoxicating. Is that how you feel when you walk into a gymnasium? Do you really? Looking round, not all of you, I would say, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I'll be honest with you, I do not find it intoxicating to be in a gymnasium. On the contrary, I need to get intoxicated if I... <laughs> if, if, if I spend more than five minutes in a gymnasium. But, Anyway, he went every day uh, because he loved it and he was good at it. And uh, 10 years later, he walked onto the mat at the Montreal Olympics 
in the male gymnastics squad of the United States. He became the most decorated male gymnast in American history. Uh, he lives now in Oklahoma. He's married, some people know the, the name I'm going to say now, he's married to Nadia Comaneci. People of my generation, well, she was the first female gymnast, from, she's from Romania, to win, to get a perfect 10 in women's gymnastics. They have a wonderful little boy called Dylan, after Bob Dylan. Why not Bob? <laughs> we don't know. It's, it's what comes from spending your life upside down, presumably. I have absolutely no idea. But, <laughs> but, but <laughs> and he and Nadia are leading members of the World Special Olympics movement. So between them, they've helped to liberate the um, athletic capabilities of thousands of gymnasts with special needs. Now, here's my point. I just want to make two quick points. The first is this, that none of that would have happened if his mother hadn't encouraged him. You could rewind the entire movie you know, to when he was eight, and his mother might have said to him, Bart, will you stop it with the hands thing? You know, we're over it. It's all very amusing, you know, but can you get on with your homework for your standardized tests? You know? um, and we'd never have heard of him, not in that capacity anyway, but she didn't, she encouraged him. And the consequence is that his life unfolded in a entirely different way. But here's the second thing. There was no way that she could have seen that journey when she walked through the doors of the gymnasium with him, in, you know, holding his hand. She couldn't see it and nor could he. They didn't know the path that lay ahead because you can't. There isn't really a path. You make your own path as you walk on it. Nobody could have anticipated, I'm sure, uh, when Millie was born, this brilliant talent that was going to come out of her or when Felix was you know, five uh, before this idea dawned on him what course this would take him on. All you can do is encourage and support and assist and mentor and believe in yourself. You see, I'm quite sure Bart's mother didn't think, no, here's Bart, you know, when he was eight. You know, he can do this hands thing. I'm sure she didn't have this linear plan, you know. Bart can do this hands thing. You know, I gather there's this girl in Romania. You know, I have a Bob Dylan album. You know, so, you know, the whole thing's coming together beautifully. I just need to get him to the gymnasium. Because human beings have the gift of creativity deep in their bones. We create our own lives. And here's the thing I really want to get to. We often mistrust it. We often ignore the talents that lie within ourselves. We don't even know they exist. We can go through your whole life without knowing what you're capable of. And the message of Well Merit Day is you're capable of extraordinary things. Everybody is. If you can dig deeper into yourself and see what, what lies there, explore your inner world as well as the world around you, and find a passion that ignites the will to achieve. I want to show you a very quick video, um, and then, we're, then we're done, if I can get to it. Um, ignore that. <laughs> there was a reason for it, but you'll never know. Oh, look at that. <laughs> wow. Ah, I didn't know I'd put that in there. <laughs> this is the follow-up to The Element. People, and when The Element came out, people kept saying to me, this is the best book I have ever read. <laughs> well, strictly speaking, oh, John said that to me, but... But people kept saying to me, but how do I find my element? I said, I've absolutely no idea, actually, but buy another copy of the book, because that'll help me out. <laughs> but in the end, I knew I had to give them an answer. So this book came out, which is a kind of practical guide to how you discover this in yourself, available from all good bookshops, incidentally. Um, this is what I want to show you. It'll kind of speak for itself. But this is um, uh, about a project in... Um, South America, it's a trailer actually for a big project. It's only a couple of minutes. Uh, I'll just show it to you, it speaks for itself, but I'll say a word or two about it, but listen carefully to it and watch what these kids are capable of. Look where they live, look what they do. Me llamo Juan Manuel Chávez, más conocido como Baby. Tengo 19 años y toco el cello. Este cello está hecho de una lata de aceite, la madera tirada en la basura y las clavijas son de una vieja cuchara para golpear la carne y para hacer el ñoquis. Y suena así. <música> Thank you. 
Una comunidad como Cateura no es un lugar para tener un violín. De hecho, el violín, un violín cuesta más que su casa. En ese grupo acá mismo encontramos el colado de violín. Y de ese empezamos los instrumentos reciclados. La familia que acá vive recicla todo lo que hay en la basura y se vende. No pensaba antes que yo voy a hacer esa instrumento. Y me siento demasiado feliz cuando estoy viendo a un niño que está tocando un violín reciclado. Cuando ya escucho el sonido del violín, siento como mariposa en el estómago, así una sensación que no sé cómo voy a explicar. Bueno, la orquesta de instrumentos reciclados es una orquesta que toca instrumentos hechos con la basura. La gente se da cuenta que no tenemos que tirar la basura muy fácilmente. Y no tenemos que desechar a las personas muy fácilmente. I have to say, I'm not involved in that project. I just came across it. It seemed to me such a beautiful example of what we're talking about. You know, the fact is we don't live in one world. We all live in two. Uh, you know, there's a world that exists whether or not you were in it. It's a world that was there before you were born. It's the world that will be there after you've gone. Uh, I, I, I saw a great thing on the, uh, it's a satirical website called The Onion about how we have to save the planet. It was a lovely comment because you know, the planet is four and a half billion years old. Human beings have been around for 150,000 years. If you think of the whole life of the Earth as one year, human beings showed up at about a minute to midnight on the 31st of December. So we're recent newcomers here. You know, the, the di dinosaurs are around for 30 million years, so far as we can tell. And they were saying, look, we have to save the planet, but actually the planet's going to be fine anyway. What we're talking about is creating a planet that we can live on. You know, the planet may conclude, if we don't get this right, you know, we tried humanity, Not so good, you know. <laughs> we're going back to bacteria. They were fantastic, actually. They, they lasted an awful long time. There's the planet, you know, the world that exists whether or not you're in it. Um, but there's another world that you live in, which is the world that only exists because you exist. It's the world that came into being when you did. It's the world that was born when you were. The world of your private consciousness, your hopes, your fears, your aspirations, your talents, and your inner passions. And I believe all of us have to take two journeys. We have to take the journey inward. We have to discover more about ourselves, about our possibilities, and we have to live in the world around us and bring our gifts to bear upon it. And it's often by exploring the world around us that we know more about the world within us. That's what Felix has done, it's what Millie's doing, it's what World Merit Day is really about. It's finding a pathway between these two worlds that will mutually enrich both of them. And I think if we get that right, and it's a personal journey, nobody can take it for you, um, You can create it as you go, you can recreate it, you're never trapped in the life you have because you're human, you can recreate it, you can rethink it. If we get that right, then there's every chance, isn't it, that we'll individually have lives that will be fulfilling, and we'll have purpose, we'll have meaning, passion. But if we connect to the world around us, as World Merit Day is encouraging us all to do, it won't just be a life of passion, but a world of compassion, a world where we look out for each other, where we create conditions where we can all flourish, a world indeed where we'll all want to live. There's no guarantee of any of these things, but if we believe more in ourselves and in the power of the people around us, there's every chance we will create a future and the world that we'd like to be part of. 
Thank you very much for asking me. Thank you.